Welcome, welcome all to Lancaster's third age-friendly summit. Um, what I consider Lancaster to be a microcosm of America and a magnet for aging boomers. I'm Chris Kennedy and I'm with Age to Age Consulting. I'm an urban planner from the 1970s and five careers later, I'm at the logical extension of my illogical career. I'm helping to envision, design, and launch age-friendly projects. So not everyone is very interested in age-friendly projects, but here in our room, we have those that are. We have 138 interested individuals. We have 69 different unique businesses and organizations that are represented in our virtual room today. And we have 127 residents of Lancaster City. One third of those in our room today are older adults choosing to age in place here in the Lancaster City that they call home. We also have two elected officials here today, and it's my pleasure to introduce to you Mike Sterla, Representative Mike Sterla and Mayor Deneen Sirachi to kick off the summit for us today. Mike? Yeah. Oh, thanks. Uh, and welcome, everyone, to the third uh, age-friendly summit. Um, there's been an obvious demographic shift um, in our country, and it's moving to an older population. Um, and that has uh, some challenges, but also, I believe, a lot of benefits. Um, Lancaster has, uh, for a long time, been known, Lancaster County anyway, has been known for a long time as a retirement destination. Um, we, uh, in Pennsylvania in particular, because of uh, our tax structures, um, have been a uh, 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 state that's been uh, very welcoming to seniors, um, retirement uh, benefits and, and income from pensions is not taxed, and so that's obviously uh, a financial incentive to have seniors locate here. Um, and I think next to Florida, we're the second largest senior population in the nation. Um, Lancaster has been uh, particularly beneficial in that way, in that uh, we've had some major players that have invested in Lancaster County and are now starting to do investments in downtown Lancaster, whether it's Willow Valley or Landis uh, Place on King. Uh, we're seeing major developments uh, specifically targeted at senior populations. Um, and so um, I'm looking forward to hearing your ideas today. Um, I'm, I am unfortunately have another meeting uh, in about an hour that I'll need to cut out of this one, but um, I'm hoping that I can get uh, a good uh, idea of what, what your ideas and concerns are. Um, and uh, I wanna congratulate uh, Mayor Sarasi for uh, the, the forward focus initiative that she's put uh, forward in the city and making Lancaster an age-friendly city. And so I'll turn it over to Mayor Sarasi. Uh, thank you, Representative Sterla. It's a pleasure to be with all of you this morning and to be talking about um, our age-friendly initiative. So this really all began in 2017 when the Lancaster Area Senior Services uh, introduced the World Health Organization's invitation to join a global network of cities uh, wanting to become more age-friendly. And this idea was brought to me uh, by Chris Kennedy and Melissa uh, Ressler, as well as Yvonne Berge. We sat in, our, in my office and I was like, I had never heard about what age-friendly cities were or did not even know that there was a global network. And now we are part of it. So fast forward, um, it is really a natural uh, for Lancaster for all the reasons that Representative Sterla mentioned. And our city council uh, said yes to applying to become a member of this global network. Uh, and that was approved in 2018. We've been doing a two year planning process. Well, really that took three because of COVID. Uh, and uh, here we are today gathering again for our third summit. And I'm so excited that so many of you have joined in this morning. The leadership of this effort has really been 
uh, a true partnership between the Lancaster downtowners and the Landis community. And I just wanna recognize their contributions to developing the age-friendly action plan that was approved in January of this past year. Uh, certainly part of that, and I've already mentioned, has been Melissa and Chris and Yvonne as sort of the nerve center of this effort. And I really appreciate your strategic leadership um, in getting us to this place. Um, this summit really marks the completion of this first uh, of our three first year of this three year action plan. And I really also want to acknowledge um, the team leads for each of those areas of action. Uh, they are Douglas Smith, um, who is the uh, senior planner here with the city of Lancaster, uh, Cindy McCormick, who's the deputy director um, of engineering and the public right of way for the city of Lancaster. And then we also have um, Kevin Ressler, who's the president and CEO of the United Way of, of Lancaster County. Thank you, Kevin. And he Heather uh, Diggy, who's from uh, Lancaster Rec. And so I'm really so pleased to have this these partners um, working together on these action plans. And of course, um, to each of our sponsors um, that have supported this first year of the action plan, we've worked really to, well together to uh, both um, develop the action plan, fundraise for the action plan, and implement the action plan, or at least um, get going in the first year of efforts. And so, I want to turn it back to Chris, um, who can share more about our sponsors and what's on deck for today. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Mayor Sirachi. I'm going to go back to screen share. I am technically challenged with some of this sometimes, so your patience is appreciated. Thank you. So for our first year, we have had tremendous support from our sponsors, Lancaster County Community Foundation, Landis Communities and High Foundation have significantly contributed to the financial side of being able to have staff work on this project. We also have Willow Valley Communities and Lancaster County Office on Aging, Garden Spot Communities and RLPS Architects. We could not have done any of this without the tremendous in-kind contrib contributions from the city of Lancaster and Lancaster downtowners and United Way and Lancaster Rec. So uh, virtual applause for all of our wonderful support. Thank you each and all. So here's what we'll be going through today. We've already had our brief welcome. We'll take a quick look at what age friendly is, why and what, and move then into what it took to build Lancaster's age friendly action plan. We'll have presentations by four of our team leads that will speak to the action plan that they have been collaborating. We'll take a brief stretch break and then we'll go into breakout sessions and you'll be able to choose your breakout session for one of the four projects. We'll have some report outs, a quick poll, and then we'll head off and each go to lunch. I get to talk about the logistics now. Um, we've asked you to rename your Zoom screen so that you've got your first name and your organization or perspective. We also welcome you to please use chat. Um, introduce yourself on chat, and if you choose your organization or your perspective, helping people know who else is in the room. Please keep your microphones muted so that we are able to have the speaker be the one that's seen and heard. Uh, again, encourage you to use chat for questions and comments. We'll share, and also please share what interests you to get more involved in. We will address as many of the questions as time permits. We've asked you to have a paper and pen or pencil handy. There'll be a short quiz that you'll just jot your own answers down for. And then during our breakout, our tech, Olivia, will be popping in to take a screenshot of your group. So when you hear Olivia come in, uh, team leads, just be patient and ask everyone to look at the camera and give a smile. So now it's quiz time. Have a piece of paper handy. The first question is, 
what was the average adult's lifespan in the year 1800? Jot down what you think. And by 1900, what was the average adult's lifespan? And at the turn of our century, in the year 2000, what was the average adult's lifespan? And the bonus question, in 1935, when Social Security began for people 65 and older, what was an adult's average lifespan? Okay, let's see how well you did. The average adult lifespan in 1800, 37 years old. By 1900, we'd gained 10 years. By the year 2000, we had gained 30 years. And the average adult was 77, and today it's 84. And in 1935, when they began Social Security for people 65 and older, the average adult was going to live to the age of 62. So even in 1935, there was no idea that we would be living as long as we are today. When I was growing up, they talked about a, a pyramid shape to the ages of our society with a number of babies being born and a baby boom coming along. And then by 1960, very few older adults, 65 and older. 100 years later, this is what it's going to look like. More older adults than children. We have a brief video that will take a moment to launch up that will help see just where all of this is going and why it's important for us to pay attention. Never in human history have so many lived so long. Data suggests that if we reach 65 years of age, it's likely we'll live to 85. We're living longer and we're having fewer babies. The Aging Society is about the fact that you have larger proportions of people uh, over the age of 60 than you have who are under the age of 15. And it's not just America that's an aging society. Europe, China, Japan, we're an aging globe. An aging society isn't just about old people. It's not just about baby boomers. Gen X will likely live longer and so will millennials. The baby boomers are an introduction to what will be a permanent shift. It is not the pig and the python, a large snake that swallows a pig, and you see that bulge going through the snake and then coming out the other end eventually. Well, ours never comes out the other end. This is a permanent state we're now in, in a remarkable shift. And the shift will utterly transform our society. How and how long we work, how and where we live, how we organize our families, medical care, economic and political lives. How we organize our thinking. This will give you an idea of what's ahead. Right now, about half of us live in the suburbs, and it's where 75% of older Americans live and want to continue to live. But suburbs were designed in the 1950s for young families and the car. There's a disconnect there we have to deal with. It's an old rule of thumb that if you can make the community work, for kids, and if you can make the community work for the elderly, that it will work for everyone else. Same with how we work. We think of 65 as a retirement age engraved in stone. But when Social Security was enacted in 1935, average life expectancy was only 62, three years less than a retirement age. Today, we can expect to live about 15 years beyond traditional retirement age. There isn't anything in the psychology literature that suggests that it's good for people to go on vacation for decades. <laughs> Even if it were a good thing, 
Few of us imagine retirement as a vacation anymore. Most of us haven't saved enough, and we're all worried, for good reason, about Social Security and Medicare. What if we reimagined our standard life course? We think of it now in three age-segregated boxes, age 0 to maybe 25, childhood and education, age 25 to 65, work, and more and more of it, raising a family, always crunch for time. Age 65 and beyond, little work, lots of rest. What if we imagined that that third box would start just three years before life expectancy today, say, around 75, not 65? What if we worked less in the middle of life and longer at the end? And what if we looked at aging and even our own mortality square in the eye? Children in American society historically have only suffered losses that relate to their parents for the most part. But today and tomorrow, they're going to suffer the losses uh, of great-grandparents, uh, of parents, of uh, grandparents, uh, and so on. So here's the point. The world we live in, the people we've become, demographically speaking, are way different from 1935 or 1950 or even 1970. But our institutions, economies, policies, Social Security, Medicare, our communities, work, all were designed for who we were 50 years ago. They don't work for us today. So are there rough waters ahead? When we think about an aging society, everybody swoons. And oh my god. You know, they write articles about defusing the demographic time bomb. Why is there an assumption there is no upside? Maybe because the upside requires change. Change we have to design, legislate, wrap our heads around. As a psychologist, I'll tell you the very first step that is really essential, and that's that we begin to envision new models, new ways of being, new lives. How will we come of age in an aging America? The conversation begins. This is a permanent state we're now in. Chris, if you're speaking, we can't hear you. I think Thank you. Me. I'm I'm back. Thank you. So in 2007, the World Health Organization was tasked with looking at this age wave and the urbanization that were major trends for the 21st century. And in talking to older adults and their caregivers in 33 cities, they came up with eight areas to take a look at to see how age-friendly your community is. And what was important to me looking at this was that not only are the obvious ones of the hard structure, housing, transportation, health services important, but also respect and social inclusion, social participation, communications and information. And with that, 33 cities from 2007 have now blossomed into 1,500 cities that have taken on the challenge of being a member of the global network of age-friendly cities and communities. And what that means is these cities, like Lancaster, Pennsylvania, has com have committed to developing an action plan that's unique to the needs and aspirations of that particular community. So joining the network was when planning began. And as Mayor Sirachi mentioned, there was a leadership team that came together with the city of Lancaster and Landis and the downtowners. And that began that planning process. Melissa Ressler, executive director of the Lancaster downtowners is going to share with you how that planning unfolded. Melissa? Right, good morning, everyone. 
Uh, very good to be with you all today uh, at this third summit. Um, this is now, we're in phase implementation. You can see on the slide here, this is the cycle that all cities and communities who join as an age, who join the age-friendly network commit to. Um, like uh, Mayor Sirachi indicated, we had an extra year of planning thanks to COVID. Um, and now we are in our first year of implementation. This means that our action plan has been approved, that we have a lot of community organizations and residents engaged in facilitating what we discovered um, really needed to be worked on in our, in our community. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. The one of the first things um, that we did with in part of our planning process was to determine how age friendly will be here in Lancaster. Uh, sometimes age friendly becomes a department in a city. Sometimes it's housed solely in one organization. What we found um, throughout our planning process um, and then codified into our mission statement was that this is a, an initiative. Um, and that the purpose of these organizations collaborating, coming together, um, will be to connect generations, other organizations, and resources to enhance the lives of older adults and ensure an inclusive community where all ages flourish. Um, and the um, mission statement was um, put together by a, a series of focus groups uh, just before uh, March 2020. Uh, so we had that framework uh, before we uh, got into um, additional evaluation. Next slide, please. And what we discovered um, in that time um, is that we could take the DAISY and focus on the areas that were most important to our community. Um, first, through uh, feedback at the original Age Friendly Summit held in 2019, we found that housing, sense of purpose and meaning, and access to services were really the three categories um, that Lancaster um, needed to focus on the most. Um, so we've uh, kind of shifted our framework um, into, into those categories so that we can create our step-by-step our -step action plans. Uh, next slide, please. And so how did we come up with this action plan? Um, it was about three years uh, based on uh, Millersville University did an environmental scan. Um, they looked at what was available and what was not available and where, where it was and where it wasn't. Uh, we held the 2019 summit and then a virtual summit in 2020 where we got even more information and kind of drilled down more on um, what elements of those priorities are very important to um, our community. We did this through focus groups. Uh, we did a COVID impact survey, reaching out to seniors to hear what was most important to them at that time. Were they receiving everything that they needed um, and what was missing? One of the results of that uh, survey was that there was an emphasis on a, a lack of um, connection to one another. Um, there was social isolation at that time. And so we kind of put together our planning and our implementation um, and launched uh, the Z Tutors program, which connected um, older adult volunteers with elementary students who are doing virtual learning for one-on-one um, -on -one reading practice. Um, and that program continues today. Finally, in 2021, we were ready to put the action plan together um, and the Age Friendly Advisory Committee held a series of meetings that, that summer um, to figure out what our precise goals, outcomes, and key activities would be. Um, and we will go into how we highlighted those. Next slide, please. Okay, area number one, housing. So the project within the housing domain is housing creation and preservation. And our goal there is that older residents are represented, are represented in equitable housing goals and policies to afford current and future generations the opportunity to age in place. And we'll hear more about um, what the progress that's been made in that this year uh, from Douglas Smith later. Next slide. Vision zero. This is also um, under our housing and outdoor spaces uh, priority. Um, the project is Vision Zero, 
Um, and our age friendly goal for that is to increase safe use of public spaces, including roadways and sidewalks for older city residents. Next. Okay, under our priority of purpose and meaning, uh, the project that was defined by the advisory committee was promoting intergenerational connections. And the goal for this action team is to increase support and opportunities for intergenerational experiences. And the final action team. So this is the access to services priority. Um, we are emphasizing communication, coordination, and outreach for this three-year action plan. Um, and this um, goal is that providers and older residents are aware of and have easy access to available services and opportunities for older adults. Next. Okay. So this was all uh, written in 2021 and approved uh, by AARP, who is the governing body in the United States for the World Health Organization. Um, and the Global Network of Age-Friendly Cities and Communities. So approved in January, 2022, um, and all of the work that you'll hear about today has been completed uh, since that time. So thank you all for your, for your interest and participation today. Thank you, Melissa. We're now going to move into our speakers. As Melissa mentioned, the first one that we will hear from is housing creation and preservation. On this slide, you can see a cut and paste of all of the material that's included in the Age-Friendly Lancaster City Action Plan, which is available online on the city website. So Douglas, you can take it from here. Thanks, Chris. And if you could just stay on the slide for a moment, uh, I'll speak to this briefly. Um, hi, everyone. Um, glad to be here and, and learn about all the work that you all are doing as well. Um, I want to briefly just say that uh, we've been making tremendous progress on many of the key activities um, that are listed uh, here on this slide. And I wanted to go through some of them now because the later slides, I really focus uh, mostly on the creation and preservation component um, and, and the city's successes there. Um, but just a couple of notes on this. Um, First, I want to acknowledge that uh, with the help of Chris Kennedy and others, we have incorporated older adults um, and uh, younger adults into really all of our planning committees um, from our comprehensive plan committee, uh, as well as our advisory committees and even our planning commission. Um, we've also designated uh, members to an age friendly task force. Thank you for those who have been participating in that. Um, and we've been uh, also working to incorporate some of that work into our interim housing strategy, which I'll provide more information on as well. Um, and uh, also we've been exploring new housing uh, models and permitting some of those in the city, which is, is very exciting. Um, we've been reviewing age-friendly housing practices and incorporating those into our comprehensive plan and are lucky enough to have uh, David Rouse, age-friendly uh, planning expert as a consultant for the city of Lancaster. Um, so we're, we're very excited by some of the data that uh, some of the work we've been able to accomplish. And uh, Chris, I hope that we'll send out the Excel spreadsheet updates uh, from everybody too, so that they can see um, some of the more specific updates. There's a lot to go through here. Um, with that, I think we can proceed to the, the next slide. Um, first, just uh, a little bit of context here. And, um, and I think uh, Representative Sterla mentioned this earlier, but you know, we're a city of about 60,000 residents um, and 12% are over the age of 65. Uh, but that's actually the fastest growing demographic right now in the city. Although the, the, the actual numbers are fairly small, it's significantly increasing. We also have a city that's a uh, median age of under 33, meaning we have a very large young population. Um, so these are, this, this effort really couldn't be more important or better suited uh, to the city of Lancaster. Um, so with that said, uh, this is an update slide from the last uh, slide, last meeting that we all had together at the uh, chamber building. And so I just wanted to provide you a quick update on this before we launch into some of the more detailed work. Um, this year alone, the city staff have engaged over 1,800 city stakeholders in the comprehensive planning process. Um, and in fact, the total number over the last um, roughly two years is well over 4,000 um, city stakeholders. So those are residents, uh, business owners, um, visitors to Lancaster City and others. 
And we've also included age-friendly advisory uh, committee in the comprehensive uh, plan policy summit. So thank you to all of you who attended that joint planning uh, effort. Um, and uh, those policies are actually underway right now, and we hope to be uh, reporting out sometime next year in the spring with a lot of our work. We also conducted uh, three comprehensive plan events focused explicitly on age-friendly planning. Um, and that's with 60 people that included roughly 32 older adults. I actually think our numbers here are, are much higher than this because we've done, uh, we did engagement with the downtowners. We also did engagement at the SACA Senior Center um, in Spanish and attended some McCaskey events that uh, engaged over 400 um, youth in the city as well. Um, I have a quote here from, from David Rouse, who I mentioned is our planning consultant. Um, Lancaster City is poised to become a national role model for smaller cities to include age-friendly best practices in their comprehensive plan. Uh, really appreciate um, David's endorsement there. And uh, the, the APA, American Planning Association, just released a new guidance document on age-friendly planning in the United States. So uh, him and I will be unpacking that and finding ways that we can um, implement that in the city of Lancaster. Um, okay, let's go to the next slide. Um, so let's get into housing creation. Um, first, the, the city of Lancaster has approved an unprecedented amount of proposed development in the city. And much of this housing will have either a direct or tangential benefit to older adults in Lancaster City. By this year's end, we anticipate having approved over 1,000 housing units for construction. Uh, through the review of those plans, I wanna emphasize that city staff are on a daily basis applying age-friendly practices. Uh, we ensure that site plans are meeting the needs of young and older populations. We review all site plans to ensure ADA compliance, clear and walkable paths, shaded and vegetative pathways, safe and secure spaces with lighting, making sure that they're safe at night and during the day, recreational facilities and community assets and, and more. We take this charge very seriously and we work closely with engineering staff uh, to ensure that those, um, those specifications are met. Uh, I'm sure that some of the developers on the call can testify uh, to that. Uh, we also hold money from developers who hold them accountable to that work uh, during development too. So two projects we are very excited to see in Lancaster City is Landis Place on King and Mosaic by Willow Valley. Of course, Landis Place is well underway with construction on King Street um, and is transforming that block already. And Mosaic will be reserving units uh, in the near future ahead of construction. Please join the breakout session with me if you want to learn more about these two developments as well as uh, the upcoming efforts from Garden Spot in Lancaster City. Um, the city is very proud to have the to have also provided historically sized investments in many housing projects in the city. Um, some of those are currently underway and others are in the approval pipeline. Just this year, the city has approved two major affordable housing projects. Um, which, although they aren't reserved directly for older adults, uh, we do anticipate this housing will benefit older populations needing affordable housing. Um, those, those projects are HDC's 213 College Ave, which has 64 units, as well as uh, Redmond's redevelopment uh, plan for 52 units. Um, and the city has provided over a million dollars to HDC's um, efforts on College Ave, which are a part of the redevelopment of um, the St. Joseph's Hospital area. More recently, um, the city has also funded additional housing projects that are in the approval pipeline. So these haven't yet been approved, but are uh, underway uh, with their approvals. Um, the Yards, which is formerly the Stockyard Inn, uh, has been allocated $2 million uh, for 45 affordable units. Um, the aim is to provide those at 60% area of area median income. Um, and uh, that, that project will be submitted as a land development this year. Uh, the city's also provided 500,000 to the YWCA for 16 units um, at their main office on uh, Lime Street and uh, to Community Basics um, as well for nine units and then 450,000 to Habitat for seven units at uh, 913 Wheatland Ave. So uh, the city is really living out its, uh, its values and what it's espousing on affordable housing. Um, so kudos to city council and the mayor and others um, on our team who have helped to make that possible. Um, 
I also just want to give a shout out to Landis Place on King. I actually pulled this quote from their website, so I couldn't attribute it to directly to a person, but uh, Landis Place on King was born out of a desire to create abundant choices, foster increased community, and provide moderate income housing for adults uh, age 55 plus. Um, so thank you for that, that vision. Uh, let's move on to the next slide. So um, the creation part of the housing work gets a lot of you know, press and uh, attention, but uh, the city is really making important strides on the preservation front. And while I am not directly involved in uh, all of this work, we have many other team members, uh, I wanna take a moment to highlight some of the work that they're doing because many of these initiatives um, really speak directly to our, the city's commitment uh, for an age-friendly city. Um, preser you know, not all of the affordable housing have, can be created from new. It has to be uh, preserved in our city too. So first, um, our Healthy Homes Program, um, this addresses a variety of health and safety hazards, including eliminating slips, trips, and fall hazards, and making other age-friendly improvements to homes that people live in, um, including accessibility updates to bathrooms. In 2022, we completed 21 of these projects um, in the city with uh, funding. And the critical repair program is extremely important to creating aging in place uh, home situations uh, for older adults. Um, these address critical or emergency repairs in uh, owner occupied housing, addressing things like roofs, um, HVAC systems, electrical, structural issues, and other health and safety hazards. We serve many low and moderate income adults uh, through this critical repair program and provide uh, financial support for emergency repairs uh, and deferred maintenance issues. So this really helps preserve home ownership so adults can safely and comfortably age in place. Um, and we've accomplished 26 of those projects in 2022. Um, the lead hazard control program I think is, is absolutely critical for age-friendly planning. Um, not only does this benefit our youth and the families that are taking care of them, um, but it ensures that people will be successful and healthy well into their older years. And, um, and this program also actually applies to older adults that are caregivers for grandchildren or who have other children visiting their home frequently. Um, so if you're if you're not familiar with this program, um, there are certain areas of the city um, where financing is provided uh, 100% uh, or nearly 100% to homeowners um, to remove all of the lead contaminated items from the homes, make sure that they meet a high standard of, of being a lead free house and actually helps pay for any transitional housing that's needed during that renovation time. Um, so if you're interested in this, please, uh, or if you know someone who's in the city that needs this, please, please, please get in touch with us and find information on our website. Um, this year, we've completed 49 projects and an additional 28 are actually in progress right now. We need willing landowners and we need contractors. Um, we've also provided uh, funding to a lot of um, uh, preservation efforts too. Um, these are in addition to the creation efforts I mentioned on the last page. Uh, half a million to partners with purpose for 97 unit rehab, $1 million to tenfold for 46 unit rehab at their transitional uh, living center, um, 850,000 to SACA for 30 unit rehab, and then uh, over a million dollars to the Lancaster City uh, Housing Authority for 270 units to be rehabbed where many older adults live. Um, and I wanna give credit to uh, Craig Walt, who's our Bureau Chief of Lead Safety and Community Development who really leads most of this work. And I've got a quote from him here. Uh, Every day, the city's healthy homes and critical repair programs are helping to make our communities healthier and more housing secure. We are lucky to have these resources available to residents. Um, so thank you, Craig, and your team for uh, leading this important work. And one more slide. Um, just let me know if I, if I have a minute left or something. Hopefully, I'm not going over. Um, Okay, so uh, now the planning part. I tacked this on at the end because I wanted to highlight um, how much we've done in engaging uh, young and older uh, city residents. Um, we've had four specific age-friendly planning meetings that have reached about 200 people. Uh, I mentioned the Senior Saka Center, uh, uh, the Saka Senior Center, sorry, and there's a picture of that on the right-hand side um, where we had 
uh, multilingual um, staff on hand to engage folks there. Um, we've had eight student meetings um, with uh, mostly students from uh, McCaskey as well as middle schools throughout the city. And that engaged over 500 youth, um, not including um, youth that it were engaged at dozens of other events. Um, some of these were actually uh, classrooms that teachers invited us into to do lessons on, on urban planning, uh, which were very fun for our staff. We, Douglas, you've got yes. about one minute. Wrap it up, please. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and then we had five artists who, through our public art community engagement program, engaged over a thousand people, um, which included many youth and younger adults. And finally, we've been prioritizing uh, innovating home sharing and community living models for younger and older households uh, as a goal of our interim housing strategy. Um, a few of these projects have, have actually already been uh, approved and are, are moving forward. Um, and we continue to explore new ways of, of doing that work. Um, so the comprehensive plan and the interim housing strategy really give us a very strong foundation to continue our work on creation, preservation, and planning work uh, to ensure that Lancaster continues to be uh, an even more age-friendly community. Um, so thank you very much for having me, and I hope that you'll join my breakout session to learn more about some key developments. Douglas, thank you very much. You're welcome. As Douglas mentioned, there's a number of new projects that are coming on board and one that has come about just since the age-friendly planning began has been interest by one of our communities in launching a home sharing platform. And it's currently in the research stages, but Garden Spot Communities is looking actively at developing uh, home sharing, which would be a living arrangement, creating affordable housing solutions, providing a service that helps match a person who has an extra room or a separate unit with a seeker who's looking for a place to live. And home sharing is increasingly an important component to the quest for using existing housing stock more efficiently. This will target older adults who are interested in renting out a portion of their homes, as well as those who are in need of an affordable rental option and may be willing to help with household chores in exchange for a portion of their rent. And Garden Spot is estimating that late in 2023, they'll be able to begin this pilot of a home sharing platform for Lancaster City and County. So as Douglas has said, and I wanna emphasize that age-friendly begins when you're born. We age from that moment on. And so to be able to look at the intergenerational aspects are so important for the health of our community. I now wanna introduce Heather Digney. And Heather has been heading up the intergenerational connections team for the action plan. Heather? Hi there, everyone can hear me okay? Yes. Wonderful, well, thank you so much for having me here today. Um, and just thank you again to Melissa and Deneen and Chris for their hard work on, on this important topic. Um, the Lancaster Rec is responsible for providing recreation programming to our community in Lancaster. And so um, that doesn't just mean kids. <laughs> that means working and providing services for older adults as well too. So it's a natural fit for us to be a part of this work and we're so excited uh, to be able to help. So next slide please. So for promoting intergenerational connections and also focusing on purpose and meaning, we've done a couple of different things so far. One of the things we did is connect a general, conduct a general community survey, which really looked for the recreation and educational program needs for all ages in our community. So not just, again, for kids and young people when you think about recreation, but also older adults as well too. And we also have scheduled four uh, lunch and learn conversations. We just recently had our first one on November 10th. We'll be having our next one on the December 15th. Um, and really, these lunch and learns hold the purpose for service providers in this space and adult audiences to connect, to talk, to exchange information, and to learn more about purpose and meaning in, in later life, volunteer opportunities, and other opportunities for intergenerational 
connections as well too. And so we've been working on that with the Lancaster Downtowners, the Lancaster Public Library, and we're getting great support as well too from the United Way of Lancaster County. So we're fortunate to have those team members help us. Next slide. So a little bit about the general community survey that we did. Again, we did it from the perspective of from Lancaster Rec, but it really helped us find some really helpful information related to this topic. So we focused on the program needs of the community, what we offer so far, how we're doing that work, and what the community likes to see. And we created two surveys actually for two different populations. We um, really reached out to our current participants to see what they had to say. And then we put a link out to the general survey uh, to survey the general population as well too. Next slide. So from that general, um, or from those surveys, we got um, some data and some feedback. This first slide shows the feedback from our current participant group. So we got about um, probably around a thousand responses from our current participants. And from there, we had about 20% of those ages 46 to 65 about 12% were 66 to 80, and about 2% five responses were individuals over 81. 79% of the respondents of that age group are female, and 20% were male, 74% of them live in city and township. So those individuals described our current programming primarily as supportive, fun, and vital for the community. But only 24% of those respondents in those age brackets thought that we had enough resources for recreation and education programming for older adults. 30% um, of those said no, and 46% of those said that they were unsure. So almost 50% not sure if we had enough resources. So the most important benefit was recreation opportunities that they cited that were provided. And really that was for our current participants, the senior center. Um, they participate, we operate an Office of Aging Senior Center here at the Lancaster Rec, as there are many in the county as well, too. So 90% said that the programming was excellent or good, they're very satisfied with it, and 76% they were very or somewhat satisfied with the programs offered. The programs that were identified that were needed were nature programs, art and performing arts, adult education, and adult fitness as well, too. Next slide. And one of the interesting things as well, we had a place for people to suggest what they'd like to see. A large suggestion was travel. So um, there are many agencies that offer group trips and bus trips and those types of things in the community, but specifically from our participants, they wanted to see more of, um, of that as well too. Next slide. So this is the feedback results from the general community survey. So we sent out postcards and mailings to all the residents in the city and township in Lancaster to get this feedback as well too. And then we also had this feedback uh, in paper form at our center and we handed out special events. So for the community survey, we, we got around three to 4,000, I can't remember the exact number, um, survey responses. We were really pleased with that. And about 10% of those respondees were um, age 46 to 65, and about 1% of those responses um, were over the age of 66. Now, we will say that we are um, thankful that that group was a little bit more uh, split uh, between male and female, and we also saw some um, diversity in our leading um, racial demographics as well too, which we were pleased with. 95% of those respondents live in, lived in city or township, which wasn't surprising to me because of some of the programs that we operate at the rec. We do have current participants that live outside the city, but I think because of those mailers, um, we had a large number of people respond from inside the city. Programs were described, current programs as fun and responsive and supportive, and more community members actually thought that we had enough resources but again, 20% didn't know if we had enough resources to serve this population. So the most important benefit continued to be that we provide recreation opportunities, specifically through the senior center, and people that knew of our program said that they were good and excellent, which is always good to hear, and that they were satisfied with our programming. Next slide. Um, similar feedback as well to nature programs, adult um, education, adult art and performing arts programs, wellness and aerobics classes, and again, travel was added. So 
as a practitioner, it was really helpful for me to hear that. Um, travel is what we want to see. <laughs> Next slide. So from this survey, uh, the survey, we, we were able to generate a number of different ideas which were really helpful. Um, and I saw coming through the chat, some people were asking about the Lunch and Learn. Don't worry, I'm gonna have that up here soon, <laughs> information for you. Um, but the idea really came about for the Lunch and Learn series of, first of all, we saw pretty clearly from this age demographic, from the surveying, that people didn't necessarily know what was out there. People said, I don't know if we have enough to serve the needs of our community. So the Lunch and Learn is, has a couple of purposes to it. One of it is for service agencies, service providers to present very, very briefly, three minutes, um, about what opportunities we have existing in the community. Then it gives us also an opportunity to, to talk with people in our community, to get deeper levels of feedback and from their perspective, ask questions, um, and also just network, get together, have lunch, have a meal, have fun. So that's how the Lunch and Learn, Learn series was born. Next slide. And Heather, to heads up, you're about a little over halfway through your time. Perfect. Um, so that's really the idea is for us to, for service providers and adults uh, to exchange ideas, uh, specifically around this idea of purpose and meaning. Um, volunteer opportunities, intergenerational connection. These are held quarterly. So again, for this year, we have four scheduled. They feature service providers in the community and they're held at rotating locations as well too. So the intention is that there are four this year and those will be held in four different locations in Lancaster County. So uh, next slide. The first one was held here at Lancaster Rec, just because honestly that was super easy to do. <laughs> and we had about two dozen individuals engaging in conversations with us in purpose and meaning. If any of you attended, thank you for coming. We featured Lancaster Rec, the Lancaster Public Library, Lancaster Downtowners, and United Way of Lancaster County uh, in our first one. And thanks again to the County Office of Aging for sponsoring lunch for us. Next slide. And we really were able to talk about the available services that already exist to inform people but then ask uh, very important questions as well too, to say, what is meaningful? What does meaning look like for you? Um, and collect that feedback and hear from other people. And it was really helpful because of what we heard from folks, obviously affordable housing was a uh, super big topic. So Douglas has his work cut out for him on that one, <laughs> but also things like intergenerational connections and social and community interactions, the opportunity for people to connect which is really what Lancaster Rec as an agency does. So we talked about outcomes like a volunteer fair that individuals could come and meet a lot of different agencies that they could volunteer for and learn how. Uh, working with United Way to do a centralized volunteer coordination system so that volunteers have kind of a one-stop shop. And then also increasing program offerings through Lancaster Rec for older adults, which Glad to share in the new year, you will see that we have an adult hip hop fitness uh, class coming. We have an adult beginner ballet, um, and we also have a Tai Chi, and those are all intergenerational programs. They're attended for age 18 and up. So if you have a friend or a neighbor or a grandchild even that wants to learn hip hop with you, come on out. We would love to have you. Um, next slide. And then this is information about our upcoming event. So it will be December 15th at 12 noon. It will be held at the Lancaster LGBTQ Coalition uh, space, The Loop, which is downtown on Chestnut Street. The registration link is there. Um, I will make sure that we put it in the chat. And again, we will have four agencies presenting on their offerings. The LGBTQ Coalition will be one of them. Music for Everyone will be presenting. Uh, an environmental group called Blackbirds will be presenting. And we are shoring up our fourth person um, this week as well. And our discussion in this next Lunch and Learn is going to be about volunteer opportunities as well too. So we're so excited to be able to connect and have discussions around that. And let me, yes, uh, if Chris or someone could put that Eventbrite link in the chat for me. <laughs> Sorry, I missed it. Um, and then just some information on some future plans that we have. Again, we, we plan to have continue to have these conversations around purpose and meaning in later life. The next of the series will be February 28th and then April 6th. We are hoping that keeping our fingers crossed by April 6th, the new beautiful Lancaster Public Library space will be available that we can have our last of the series there. Um, and also if you are engaged with a service organization, please let me know if they would like to speak uh, at one of these Lunch and Learn series or if they would like to host us in their physical space. 
Um, we've got a picture there from the senior games, February 28th, we'll have the folks from Office of Aging presenting about Lancaster senior games. So if you've ever wanted to know about that and learn more, it's a great time to do that. So, um, and if you'd like to join us for the, um, the breakout uh, group working on this work and help plan these lunch and learns, please let me know. Uh, and in my breakout session this afternoon, we'll discuss a little bit more about what that looks like and talk a little bit more about what we did on November 10th. If, in case you can join us, we'll, we'll review that as well too. So thank you so much. Heather, thank you. Well done. Yeah. And uh, your point about um, ideas or organizations that would like to present, I want to remind people that put it in chat right now and Heather will get it. And so if you have ideas for intergenerational opportunities, put them in chat before you forget them. So our next speaker is actually Carl Graybill. He is stepping in for Cindy McCormick, who is the lead on the Vision Zero age-friendly action plan. But Carl has been involved in every part of Vision Zero. And so I'll turn it over to Carl right now. Carl? Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'll do my best to, to fill in for, for Cindy. Um, and uh, this, I'm going to give an overview of the of the Vision Zero program, uh, what it is, and what it is intended to do, and some of the projects um, and um, uh, future that you'll see with the Vision Zero. Uh, next slide. Uh, so the Vision Zero Action Plan is a uh, Vision Zero is. Uh, an effort to eliminate all uh, serious and fatal crashes. Um, you know, our, our goal is by 2030 to eliminate all, all traffic related deaths and serious injuries. Uh, we put together a plan uh, with a consultant uh, several years ago. Uh, it was adopted in November of 2020. And the goals of that plan are to base our, our efforts and implementation uh, on data. Uh, so we're looking at crash data. It's uh, equity driven. So it is age friendly. It is looking at uh, more vulnerable populations, um, recognizing that it's changing the culture a bit from from automobiles um, and, you know, recognizing that our streets aren't made just for cars and um, looking at safety and slowing speeds. Uh, next slide, please. So the the Vision Zero approach is it's a different approach to what has been done before, um, and looking at that that transportation safety that accepts no uh, loss of life or serious injury on the transportation system. In the past, it was viewed that uh, uh, traffic deaths are in inevitable. Uh, but we recognize that they are preventable. And it was based on uh, expectation of perfect human behavior. Um, and the new approach is, integrates that, that human failing. We are human after all. Um, and that it, you know, it was focused on pre trying to prevent collisions. Uh, we recognize that we're not gonna be able to prevent collisions or crashes but we can reduce the severity and, and eliminate uh, fatalities from those crashes. Um, and it's a, we have to look at it system-wide. It is holistic. Um, it's not just individuals. Uh, and that um, it is not expensive to, to make an effort to save lives. Next slide. The, this graphic is is good to show why it is important to slow traffic uh, and slow vehicles. As I mentioned, you know our streets are not are not made just for cars. People use our streets. People walking, people uh, using mobility devices, people on bicycles, people in cars. So our streets are for people. And as uh, the speed of traffic increases, a couple things happen. Uh, one is the, the vision, uh, the cone of vision 
that's at the bottom of this graphic, it, it is de it decreases. So your field of view is is greatly reduced as your speed increases in the car. And if you strike somebody, um, or if somebody is is uh, struck by a car at 20 miles per hour, they have a an 18 percent chance of being uh, killed or seriously injured. That increases dramatically as the speed increases, as this graphic shows. Next slide. Uh, continuing with the idea of that, that we're basing things on on data. Um, we are looking at uh, we, we our planning effort was a few years ago, so this is updated data uh, from from that. Um, there were uh, it, there's really no trend line here because you know it's it's increasing, it decreases. Uh, the the crashes decreased in in 2020. That could be because of COVID, but then the following year they went up. Uh, anecdotally, we've seen some some increased severity of crashes because less cars on the road meant higher speeds. People could drive faster, um, but it's it's hard to say what that trend is. But um, digging a little deeper, this is just total crashes and total people killed and seriously injured. But looking at it uh, a little bit more deeply, uh, of the 98. Uh, crashes that occurred uh, between 2017 and 2021 that were killed or seriously injured, that involved uh, persons killed or seriously injured. 27% uh, of those uh, crashes involved people over the age of 60. Uh, disproportionate, as this graphic is also showing, uh, a disproportionate uh, number of uh, the vulnerable population. This doesn't show it by age. But on the left, you'll see that uh, the, the vast majority of crashes incur a motor vehicle. Uh, but when you look at the, the people killed in, and uh, seriously injured, uh, motor vehicle drops and pedestrians uh, jumps from 8% of all crashes involve pedestrians to 33% of those that are killed or seriously injured. Um, the and using the all that data we were able to identify you can go back to that previous slide with the high injury network next next there you go um using all the data we are, are doing some additional planning and prioritization of where we want to implement projects uh, this map shows the high injury network and focus areas. A high injury network is where the, the, the most crashes uh, occur. Um, there's also a lot of uh, uh, other information on this map. It shows this map is also showing uh, persons uh, over the age of 60 where crashes occurred. Those are the smaller blue dots. The asterisk looking uh, a uh, symbol there is our top 10 uh, high injury uh, or top 10 intersections where the um, highest number of killed and seriously injured persons uh, occur at these intersections. Um, and the shaded areas are, are uh, what we call focus areas. And they, they include criteria such as uh, age, uh, both young and older folks. Um, uh, persons without an access to an automobile, uh, lower income, uh, persons in poverty, uh, persons uh, with um, English as a second language, uh, identifying those, those uh, higher vulnerable areas and so that we can identify uh, 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 opportunities for, for uh, implementation of, of uh, countermeasures. Uh, next slide. Carl, and, we've just got one minute, so let me flip through these really quickly. Okay, I'm going to I'm I'm going to uh, talk quickly about the implementation. We are prioritizing our projects in those focus areas: a high injury network, uh, top ten intersections. Uh, mm -hmm. Next slide. Um, we have been implementing projects. A lot of projects are being implemented. Um, 
we are, this is a, a, an image of a street crossing, uh, Walnut Street. It includes the high, high visibility crosswalks, the, pa the uh, pattern pavement. Uh, you can't see it here, but there's also a flashing beacon. Uh, there's a green painted bicycle lane here. Um, a, a very quick video, uh, look at the signal is the red signal. Uh, the hand, uh, the, the pedestrian signal says don't walk. Um, this is called a leading pedestrian interval. And when, uh, could you start that video please? I it just takes a few seconds. Yes, you, if you move, oh, there you go. Pedestrian is allowed to walk. Red light is still on. Now the red signal changes to green and vehicles are able to turn. So it allows the pedestrian, gives the pedestrian three seconds to start that crossing before vehicles start turning. Uh, it's one of the implementation efforts that we've uh, undertaken. And uh, here is our, our we can't do all of this without engaging the public. So we need to have an engagement and education uh, program. Uh, this is a, a just a screenshot from our Engage Lancaster uh, website. Uh, it'll take you to all these different projects that we're working on, uh, some of the completed projects. It'll also take you to our Vision Zero uh, website uh, where you can get a lot more information uh, the QR code, uh, if you scan that, you'll be able to go right to that okay, website. During your breakout session today, would you be able to talk in more detail about some of the projects that are currently working? Would that work? Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah, and I was going to, at the breakout session, we can talk about more about the uh, progress that we've made on the action plan. Excellent. Um, have a lot of uh, data and, and other things on that. So okay. thank you. Thank you. And now we're going to be looking at the communication coordination and outreach. And Kevin Ressler is the CEO president of United Way. And I'm going to stop screen share because he wants to show us his slides. So yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna just give me one second here so I can get to that. Um, so I'm gonna uh, catch us up on time a little bit, Chris. Too, I know that we're we're running a little behind. So uh, our group is the communications, but it also has been a, really a, a focus strongly on access to services. And so I'm gonna uh, run you all through a couple of different slides. I'm gonna start with um, taking a look here. There you go. You should be seeing my screen there. Uh, I'm going to start by taking a look at a dashboard that my colleague uh, Maria Lapp here put together. Um, this allows us, you're just seeing a, a static presentation of this, but this type of, of work allows us to dig into analysis around comparatives and other information. So this is two-on-one data. If you're not familiar with two-on-one, it is a 24-hour call center, connects to 600 nonprofits in Lancaster. We run it for seven counties, so there's 3,000 organizations we connect to for information and referral, which if someone is crossing or moving from one place to another is helpful. So what I did was I took a look at some of our needs in the community that have been called in, texted in, um, emailed in, whatever the case may be, taking a look at what are the needs for 55 plus community members in Lancaster County specifically. And so uh, just a, this is a, a lot of graphs. I'm gonna break it out here in a second here to, to be a little bit more visually uh, appealing for you all. But uh, what we see is a significant increase in needs in 2022 to 2021. Part of that, and it's part of an outcropping of this work in our, in our group um, has been the fact that uh, we've started to better track 55 plus as a category as opposed to just general community needs. So you can see there's a significant increase. The largest one there at the beginning is income, uh, family, community support. That's largely driven by the VITA program. Um, and so if you take that out, what you see is housing is the number one concern. Utility assistance is, is the number two concern, which is uh, all of those are obviously connected to income. Uh, and then there's some other some other initiatives and, and issues there. So, um, I'm gonna jump here to slide two. So just breaking that out so you can see it. Uh, um, this is the yearly. So we had 4,172 unique contacts in that population group representing 5,862 different needs. So often one person calls 
for one need, they find they have multiple ones. So if you call and you say housing support, there's a good chance that that means you've got income need support, you may have food insecurity, all of these different things. The partners in our group, and um, I should have mentioned that before Chris stopped her slide, uh, but the partners who have been in our group are, are organizations who are working on this. Um, so the, the Lancaster Downtowners, um, CAP, is in that conversation. Uh, we also have the city of Lancaster has been a big part of that conversation in a variety of needs. Uh, we've had uh, the LGBTQ coalition, uh, Pavelco Consulting. Now I'm gonna forget people and feel completely uh, awful about it. Lancaster County Office of Aging. Um, uh, and, and so some others in that group as well. So what we see here, this is a sorting as you're looking at these issues. These are things that we refer to other agencies, those different partners. So what are the stop gaps? Where are the ways that we're not communicating well from an agency side and then to the public about what needs are available? So if we look at November, just November of 2022, we had 495 uh, unique contacts representing 699 needs. This, these numbers were not all the way through November, but uh, almost all the way through November. Um, and so again, we see individual family community support, um, we see that there's housing. Now, these, this arrow is not designated as priority. I just wanted to sort of represent that none of this stuff is independent. If you have one need, you have more than one need. If you have one challenge, you have more than one challenge. And part of our job is to figure out how do we navigate that? If we look at 2021, again, we see housing is that number one concern. Um, and you've heard, and you will continue to hear about issues around transportation and other things. Now, again, these are not all the needs in the community. These are the ones that go through two-on-one. But again, just wanting to show you, here's that breakdown for the whole year. We've got VITA programs um, is, is number one. So VITA is the Volunteer Income Tax Assistance Program free income tax support for anyone making household income $60,000 a year or less. That, by the way, will start in January. Any one of you who are in that need can call 211 and get scheduled for that. Um, so that's a really important type of service. But how does that service then connect to other needs, not just that one program, but others? And so that's what we're looking at. November top 10, um, Christmas baskets is a, is a big one that those are food baskets that are available through Lancaster County Project for the needy. And so, so that pops up high in November. Other months, are, other months are different issues. So this is just a way that we're sort of looking at that. Now, um, wanna jump over to, eh, where's, I don't know where my slide is for what have we done. Um, so what have we done? Uh, we put together a food access, I'll leave it there so you can take a look at the top 10 needs for, for November, 2022 while I talk. But so we have put together a food access uh, resource sheet. Uh, that sheet was, um, able to help individuals know where can they get free food, you know, community meals, those types of, of things, food banks, those types of things. Uh, we distributed that amongst a variety of faith communities as well as nonprofit organizations. And what we're trying to do there is make sure that everybody has a, a sort of a whole common list knowing where things are, where, they, where people can go, uh, and then working to make sure organizations are able to, to connect in other ways. We also did a significant amount of work around language access. So language support systems, the city has been uh, really, really great. Zyra has been leading that charge, the city. Uh, we've been at United Way put together a language access grant to create translations for organizations like Church World Service so that we're making sure that we're not just providing access to sort of general population 55 plus, but that we're actually making sure that that access is is for then what is within those categories, age in this case, what are the specific needs of different marginalized populations with unique barriers, right? Can't just be about a broad brush, it has to be a broad brush and also fine strokes. We've also uh, then did an assessment for all the partners who we have in our age-friendly uh, conversation. We said we have to start with ourselves before we go to others. So we, we took a look at those and we found things like, you know, hey, look, Google Translate is a way that an organization can for free work with someone when they walk in the door. Who has translation services? Two-on-one does. The County Office of Aging Call Center also has translation services. Um, oftentimes that's contracted out, has a cost, it's expensive, but we make sure that that's available to the community and particularly 
this uh, aging population. Uh, we know that we are an aging population. We know that we are both aging as those who have been here, but also those who are being imported from other communities. We've been rated as the number one retirement community. And then we've also got to make sure that we're thinking about that refugee population, that immigrant population who have extra barriers within, within language. The last thing that, that we've done is, is figure out then how do we share those tools with one another? What are the, what are the various things? So the question then becomes, um, for you all, right, is, okay, what, what is it that, that um, well, sorry, upcoming topics, finding a single point of reliable age-focused information is going to be a big initiative for us over the coming year. Transportation challenges you've heard about already, but what are the access problems of that? Not the system itself, cost of transportation, whether or not people have uh, physical, geographical access to that active uh, transportation. How do they get there if they have a bike? Can they get their bike to a, to a bike walking trail? Public transportation, you know, is are these, these things accessible? Another thing that we know is a big problem is home health care access and navigation. Is It may be available, but it's not always easy to get through that. And, and um, the last one there, completing applications, that's part of the challenge that comes with that. In many cases, some of us as organizations are able to point people to services, but are not allowed based on those services or legislation, not allowed to actually fill out the form for a person because we're not their power of attorney or whatever. How do we get some advocacy going to allow agencies to be able to work with the person right in front of them? You know, you have someone who can make the language translation. Uh, into an English form, but they can't actually physically put that information in. How do we work at improving some of those types of things? The last thing I'll mention there, uh, 201 has been getting some significant funds from the federal government to do a referral tracker. The information I showed you at the beginning shows you who called 211 and where did we refer to, but we don't always know if someone actually ever connects with that agency or receives those services. This tracker will be able to allow us to see who received those services from organizations and see who's referring to others outside of 201 to have a much better data-driven way of knowing where services, what's available, what's actually being provided, and how can we continue to improve as organizations. Briefly here, um, what can you do? Uh, we want you to take an assessment of your own language tools that are available already, and what could you what could be available to you in the future. We'll work at getting some information out on what we already know and hopefully learn from you all. What are you currently doing that could be improved across age-friendly initiatives? Just ask the question. If you're not asking the question, you're not even going to know where you are. So just take the time to be intentional. And then we'll continue to take, a, um, you know, what you can do is find those local resources, uh, you know, peruse through the, the two-in-one guided search, which is going to give you a lot of agencies and you can search through category, but also just know what's available. Call the Office of Aging if you have a need. They are there and ready and available. Um, our breakout room, this is what we're going to ask. We're going to ask, why are you in this conversation? What, what do you expect to see? How can you contribute? Where do you see strengths? Who is not part of the conversation that needs to be often the most important question when we start to have these conversations in a room is who isn't here? Why are we making decisions for people who aren't present? Let's make sure that we're actually making informed decisions and then setting milestones, points of concern. What are we worried about? What year, 10,000 seniors become 60 every day. So when does that hit a certain inflection point on workforce on other, where are the moments that we really need to be prioritizing from a time perspective to be prepared for when those moments come? So that is mine and I did it in 11 minutes, not 12. So I didn't save you as much time as I thought I would. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> and you're muted, Chris. Well done, Kevin. Very well done. Thank you. And thank, so, sorry, thank you. Uh, Brightside Opportunity Center has also been a big part of that about that team. <laughs> um, for those of you that haven't ever used two one one, I had the opportunity in the past month to assist someone that needed some services, and I got to be a handholder as the call was being made and simply 211 on the phone and the person that answered was kind and gentle and guided this person through what choices to make and what options they had so um it was a great chance to experience 211 well i want to personally thank each of you for setting aside two hours today. It was a long stretch uh, to learn about the work that has been done. And with the opportunities 
and the challenges of an aging demographic. We have some really great organizations here in Lancaster as a microcosm of America and a magnet for aging boomers. And uh, we can benefit from the creative aging, from the revenue and philanthropic opportunities that the longevity economy can offer to us. So we have benefits and we have challenges ahead. And I'm going to give you an extra five minutes to your day and wrap up now. Thank you for being part of the second, third Age Friendly Summit.